I'm going to try not to flick through all the answers again. Oh, sorry, there's a siren. Is that? Okay. Um, so, yeah. Hi, guys. We've just got some short cases today, um, different modules in, in year four. So, I'm just going to start with an SBA. So, it's a four year old called Sally. She's brought into a GP practice, and her mum says that she's been getting quite tired over the last few weeks. She's been bruising easily, and she's had two colds in the last month. Um, her mum has also noticed some swollen glands in her neck. Which of the following is not a pro poor prognostic factor for the most likely diagnosis? I know it's a negative and you still don't really do negatives, but I thought I'd just put it in to make a point. Anyone have any ideas? Put it in the chat. Oh, sorry, no, there's no mentee, it's just in the chat. Okay, anyone else? Gonna hazard a guess. Got a wide variety of answers. Okay. So the answer is actually B. This is a bit of a mean question. Does anyone know what, what diagnosis I'm going for to begin with? Like the underlying thing here. Yeah, specifically, anyone know what? what? Yeah, ALL, exactly. So um, yeah, so the answer is ALL because that is the most common leukemia in children um, and the one that is not a poor prognostic factor is being a child because actually being an adult is a poor prognostic factor for ALL um, so if we just go through that um, so there's quite a lot of text in this but you can read this in your own time but it's basically the lymphoid progenitor cell becomes altered and then goes proliferates uncontrollably and it kind of infiltrates organs and the bone marrow especially which is why you kind of get those core symptoms from bone marrow failure because you're not getting the red cells your white cells your platelets and all that's being produced um and in terms of why it's especially relevant for you guys in year four is because it's the most common one you're going to find in children it's actually quite a rare leukemia generally but um it's the most common one for children and it's the peak incidence is about two to five so kind of preschool age and it's more common in boys and girls um generally you don't need so much detail i don't think about the cancer management apart from like specific therapies like i can tell you later but for this it's just basically supportive and chemo um so can anyone tell me what kind of are you, so i've just put on the side you get anemia and things like that what kind of symptoms are you going to get from bone marrow failure Yeah, well done, yeah. Shortness of breath, tiredness, exactly, increasing infections. And then if you've got low platelets, what's going to happen? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, bruising, well done. It's already good. Um, so, yeah, basically, anemia is going to cause the first ones. Low white cells, you're going to get frequent infections, or you're just going to have a really delayed recovery in between as well. And then I'm just going to put a picture up. It's quite small, but basically, just to show the difference between patechiae and ecchymoses, um, so they're basically both both of them are bleeding into the skin, but patechiae essentially is like really small dots and the ecchymosis is like the far right. So it's even bigger. And in between you've got purpura, just if anyone's confused about that. And yeah, that's what you're going to get from the low platelets, basically. Does anyone know any other features you might get in ALL apart from the, the symptoms from the bone marrow failure? It's not necessarily specific to ALL. ones 
Oh, sorry, I went to chat and load. Yeah, I think gum hypertrophy is an AML and B symptoms. Yeah, exactly. So constitutional symptoms. That was a good guess. So the gum hypertrophy and the skin involvement are, um, sorry, the gum hypertrophy and skin involvement are like the buzzwords for AML. Um, but yeah, you get B symptoms. So if we go through some things, um, so one thing like in the uh, in the um, question I put about her swollen glands, you get lymphadenopathy, um, and that's painless and it's freely movable for for those glands. I put it in the slide notes, and then the hepatic splenomegaly, like I said before, it's just literally cell infiltration, um, and then the fever could be because they've got these repeated infections, or it could be your B symptoms, as you said, so constitutional symptoms, um, and then bone pain again from infiltration. So that first question was a bit mean, but I do think it's worth for ALL learning the poor prognostic factors. Um, so basically being an adult, being male, if you have the chromado um, Philadelphia chromosome, so what what cancer is the Philadelphia chromosome um, actually associated with? Typically. Yeah, well done. Yeah, CML. Um, so the, this is, I mean, this is just for you to look at, to be honest, but maybe just have it, but like just in the back of your mind. I think it'd be a bit harsh for them to ask you specific numbers for the white cell count, but like just the Philadelphia chromosome in ALL is a bad sign. Markers on the cells are a bad sign, being an adult, being male, basically. Um, okay, so we got Sally again, but then she's basically been undergoing chemo for her ALL and you're working in a &E when her mum brings her in because she's been profusely vomiting. She's diarrhea and she's got weakness in her legs as well as cramps. Um, you check her creatinine and you realise it's 2.5 times her baseline. So all of the following can be used in the prevention of the condition that I'm talking about, except from which of these. So only one of these you don't use in the pre prevention of this condition. Yeah, okay, well done. It is E. So what, what syndrome is going on here? What's what's the underlying thing that's happened here? So she has got an AKI, but it's secondary. Yeah, so it's secondary to the tumor lysis syndrome. Does anyone know, just testing Irina, what stage AKI she's in? If her creatinine is 2.5 times her baseline. Yeah. She's in stage two AKI. Well done. That was really good. Um, so yeah, this is tumor lysis. Um, so she's getting the weakness and the cramps either because of the hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, or also because of the hypocalcemia. Um, and she's gone into AKI because of because of the release of all these um, electrolytes, basically. Um, so tumor lysis basically happens when you go through chemo because you kill loads of um, tumor cells at one time and it basically means that all of the contents of the cells are just released into the bloodstream and all of so that's why you get the raised urate raised potassium raised phosphate and because there's high phosphate in the blood um the calcium basically gets precipitated to to it's trying to mop up the phosphate in your blood basically to form calcium phosphate and as a result you get low calcium so that's how i remember that um that's the only ion that's lowered and that's such an easy question to ask you um for for that um, quick question to Seema. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure about that. Anish, I'm going to leave that with you. Um, but yeah, so that, that's basically the main thing. Um, the main thing to remember is that you've got those three ions that are up and calcium is low because you're trying to mop up all the phosphate in your blood, basically. And you can get a secondary AKI um, in tumor lysis, which is also something to bear in mind. Um, so basically management, as usual, you're going to start with an AD assessment of your patient because they're usually quite critically unwell. You want to hydrate them, so you give them IV saline. And then you can either use allopurinol or rasburicase. You don't 
um, these you don't give them together because it reduces the effect of aspiric case, but I don't think they'll ask you that. Basically, just remember those drugs and that you want to hydrate them is like the mainstay of management for this. OK, so we've got a different person now. Um, you're working at a GP practice and notice that some routine bloods for an 84 year old patient are slightly strange. He's got anemia and lymphocytosis. So a blood film is eventually ordered and that's what it shows. What's the most likely underlying diagnosis? Also, yeah, I would say chemo is generally not um, examined. The only thing I'd remember is what I was talking about before is for CML, just remember imatinib because that is a BCR able tyrosine kinase inhibitor and that's specific for the, um, yeah, exactly, use imatinib um, because that's specific to that mutation in there. So that's the only one that I'd like really remember is imatinib for CML. Um, so what people said? Yeah, yeah, go on the extra step, exactly what I was gonna ask you what cells they are. So it is smear cells and it's CLL. Um, so I think I put into the arrow. I mean, it literally looks like, oh yeah, smudge or smear cells. Um, I mean, it literally looks like the cells been smudged. And the thing to remember with CLL is like, it's it's an elderly, it's an adult cancer, but it is actually often really asymptomatic and patients, you don't, they don't realize they have it until it's literally just picked up and they've got low hemoglobin and they've got high white cells. Um, so that's just to bear in mind, not all of them are gonna present with like constitutional symptoms like fatigue, weight loss, all of that. Um, yeah, so well done, That that is what it is. Um, does anyone know what the gold standard investigation is for CLL? or the, the diagnostic investigation is. So we do different ones, but there's one that's diagnostic. Okay, so it's flow, flow cytometry for CLL. Um, it's basically just looking at markers on um, the cells so that they can target treatment, basically. Um, but just like generally, like you would do with other anemias, you're gonna do a full, full blood count. And like I said, the, if you've got raised white cells and they've got hem low hemoglobin, and then the blood film, the classic like SBA one, they could give you a film of it is um, smudge cells. Um, I think it is worth learning things like that because it's actually quite like once you've learned it, it's just one fact and it can just give you the answer to a question. So I think it is worth it for, for specific cancers if they have something like a smudge cells, very specific CLL. So I would just learn that. Um, so yeah, if, if you ask what the diagnostic thing is, it's flow cytometry for CLL um, and you're looking um, so they can target treatment and they also use it for prognosis as well. Um, so like we said before, you don't really need to learn um, like specific managements um, for the cancers. Um, but just for CLL, the, like I said, you can give chemo immunotherapy. You can also watch and wait because, like I said, a lot of them are asymptomatic um, and an allogeneic stem cell transplant is also one, but there's like specific criteria. You don't need to know anything about that, just that that's an option. So, so donor stem cell transplant, basically. OK, so Mr. Marks calls you one month later, complaining that he's recently been experiencing night sweats, bad nausea, two consecutive chest infections and large glands in his neck. What is the most likely explanation for these symptoms? I think this is a bit mean. Yes, we got a couple of anyone else. Yeah, okay, so it is D. What is what is this process that's happening here? Does anyone know? Like what the underlying thing is? What it's called? Yeah, well done, Richter's transformation. Um, so basically, Richter's transformation is from CLL into non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
um, and it tends to be the diffuse large B cell lymphoma. I don't think that RT as specific as that, but just just know that it's basically you get a CLL transforming suddenly into a they become quite un acutely unwell. So, like I said, they can be asymptomatic for ages with the CLL, and then if they undergo the rich transformation, they basically get all these constitutional symptoms, and they become yeah, they become really ill basically. And the transformation is from CLL into non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I just want to step further to say that it was a diffuse uh, large B cell one, which is the most common non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, yeah, so just like I said, they basically go into the lymph nodes and they change into high grade, fast growing. It's really bad. Um, so you get all these symptoms, you get the lymph node swelling, um, get the fevers as a constitutional symptom, you get the weight loss or unless or they've got repeat infections, um, weight loss, night sweats, nausea, all of that, basically. Um, yeah, well done for getting that. I think that's that's like a bit more knowledge. Um, so that's good. Does anyone know any other complications of CLL generally? Like some buzzwords, one of them is another heme, heme condition. Actually, two of them are. It can, it can cause another type of anemia. Does anyone know what it is? Yeah, well done. It's exactly, it's warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. I just like remember that. It's one of the complications of it. It can also cause, does anyone know what else it can cause? Okay, well, it's kind of niche anyway, but yeah, so you can get hypogamma globulinemia. Yeah, ITP, yeah, really well done. Um, so low platelets, um, immune thrombocytopenia, and um, warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So those three are the things I'd remember. And obviously, if you've got low immunoglobulins, you're going to get recurrent infections as well. Um, so I think, yeah, they could put in a niche question about CLL resulting in the warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia and kind of link it in. Um, it might be a bit mean, but yeah, so that's basically, I think for those two cancers that I've done, I think that's literally all you need to know for them. Um, and maybe even more like they might not even ask you about the richer transformation stuff. So really well done guys for getting all that. Um, so that's all of mine. I think it's Prina's, Prina's um, slides now, if you want to take control. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Yeah, 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 you're good. Oh, you um, okay? And you, you can just see the slides, right? You can't see the like notes yeah. on the slide. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. So um, I'm gonna play some Linky with you guys. Um, because I I couldn't make any SVOs. Sorry. <laughs> um. So Linky is like it's like a board game, but we're gonna play it um just with some pictures. Basically, there'll be like four pictures. We'll talk through them and we'll work through it together. But the idea is we like find an overarching theme that brings them all together um and I, I look through your feedback and some of you guys are like just high yield cover the big stuff and others are like don't know where to start with the niche stuff so that'd be good as well so I'm going to try and do my best to address both of those um so this is the first set of like cards um so if you want to just start typing in the chat what kind of things are you seeing or thinking of you can say like top right or top left, whatever. Yeah, yeah, very good. Oh, yeah, okay. There is a granuloma. The so the pathology slide is a granuloma. Yep. So someone said caseating and somebody else has said non-caseating okay we'll talk through that yep um yeah that could be papilledema and the bottom right is gout okay cool perfect so we've got like the big bit so if we talk through erythema nodosum first on the top left um what what kind of like words in a stem would describe erythema nodosum to you? Like, what would they say it looks like or the patient complains of? Yeah. Yeah. 
pretty much. And what do we know causes it? Yep. I'm just waiting for all the messages to now <laughs> come in. Sarcoid, yep. Um, TB, yep. IBD, TB, good. Okay, so I'm going to tell you how I remember erythema nodosum. And I've been told it's a bit silly, but if that's what helps you remember it, it's what to help you remember it. So um, I have an acronym. Um, so E stands for erythema, it's red. R is that it's a raised rash. And then Y stands for like, yikes, it's painful. Um, <laughs> and then there's just the word them as you reference the anterior part of your shins. Um, but just a side note, it does affect other parts of your body. So you can get it on the arms as well. Um, and then for what causes it, um, so no dosum, um, where N-O, no stands for that there's no cause. So most of them are actually idiopathic. Um, D is for any drugs. So any, what drugs do you guys know that causes erythema and dosum? Sulfonamides, good. And then what the other classic, there's one other classic one that I always remember, penicillins, perfect. Um, yep, yeah, and then O stands for the oral contraceptive. And whenever I think, <laughs> whenever I think about the contraceptive, I also think about pregnancy. So they go hand in hand. Um, S is like sarcoid and all the like weird stuff like Beschert's. Um, UC is and IBD go together. And then M stands for micro and malignancy. So like you guys said, TB, um, do you guys know any other micro or like organisms that cause it? Okay, so the other one I'm thinking of is EBV. I don't know about Campylobacter, sorry, um, and brucelliosis. Um, and then which is the classic malignancy that's associated with it? <laughs> lymphoma, perfect. Yeah, and you, like hopefully remembering like lymphoma will tr trigger you to think about EBV and vice versa. Okay, so that's the top um, left. So the top right, um, someone said it was a granuloma, which is good. And then we had some debate about whether this is caseating or non-caseating. Um, so this is a caseating one. And um, at the end, I'll, I'll like show a bunch of pictures of granuloma. And generally, I find like with the caseating ones, because like it means that it's necrotizing, there's like an area in the middle where there's no like nucleated cells it's just dead stuff so can you see like in the center of this like round histology thing there's like a patch with no cells in them that uh no like nucleuses no dots basically that's how I remember whether it's caseating or not um and the general rule for fourth year is if it's necrotizing and caseating it's infectious if it's not, yeah, basically. <laughs> if it's not, then it's more inflammatory and something else like sarcoid, Wegmans, Crohn's. Um, they're the only sort of three big ones for your year in terms of what causes it to be non-caseating. Okay, cool. So then somebody said that the bottom right was gout. Good. Um, so let's talk about gout quickly. It's caused by anything that increases your uric acid or decreases its breakdown. So um, Divya already helped us slightly with tumor lysis syndrome. Um, but what other causes of gout do we know? Or what are the risk factors? Beer, yep, we love to see it. <laughs> Pure and rich diet, red meats, thiazides, yeah. Yeah. And um, what what is the like buzzword thing that they'd say in an SBA stem for how it looks under the microscope? Yeah. Perfect. 
Um, good. And gout, like how do you distinguish gout from the other sort of main red hot joint problems? What are your like go-to questions in a room history? Yep. Okay, so my like main questions that I'd be thinking about with a red hot joint is like, have they got a fever to go with it? Because if they do, yeah, is it mono or poly? Yeah, and is it like a very typical gouty joint? So is it the elbow or the big toe? Um, and is there like toe fi nearby as well? Um, just to jump off that point about aspirating, if you think it's septic arthritis, when is the only time that you wouldn't aspirate? Yeah, so if it's not, if it's an artificial joint, don't go near it <laughs> um, because they have to do that in theatre. Okay, finally, the one on the bottom right was a swollen, irregular, like pale optic disc. Um, so this wasn't papilledema, this is optic neuritis. Um, and in fourth year, what are the two, like, what's the biggest thing you have to think of when someone has optic neuritis? MS, perfect, yep. And Okay, so having said that, um, what do you think is like the overarching theme that links these four cards together? Being treated for TB, perfect, yep. And um, so TB can give you erythemonidosum, it will cause the granuloma, and what drug causes the optic neuritis? Ethan, perfect. And what drug causes the gout? Only three others. Yep, perfect. And the other one, um, rifampicin, what's the main side effect that you need to remember about? Everything turns orange. Yeah, perfect. And hepatic toxicity. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably the more important one. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Here we go. Next, Linky. Um, Anoush said this is like slightly difficult. So I've added in the, the second ECG at the top, but we'll, we'll make our way through it. We can do this. So start putting initial thoughts in the chat. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Mm hmm Good. <laughs> hemorrhages in the eye, good, yep. Specifically, what kind of hemorrhages? Cotton wool spots, maybe. Yeah. Okay. I like where this is going. Does anyone want to tackle the middle photo? Uh, it could be an insulin pump. Yep. Um, the main focus of the middle photo so <laughs> is not the thing that's like stuck onto the guy, but the like um, more his like. Yeah. Okay. The injection marks. Good. Yep. And. The dent, yeah, good. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll make it more medical in a second. So let's tackle the ECG first. Oh, sorry. What someone said this was torsades, yep. And how can you tell this is torsades instead of just like the F V T? It's polymorphic, yeah, but so is VF. Oh, I like that ribbon like pattern. Yeah, I'm waiting for someone else to say another buzzword. Okay. 
Arctic Monkey album cover. <laughs> A sine wave, yeah, exactly. Um, so someone asked me this. <laughs> um, someone asked me this a few weeks ago in the um, cardio one that I did. They were like, "How can you tell the difference between VF and um, torsades?" And this ECG strip up here shows it really nicely because you see how like the the actual QRSs be between themselves are polymorphic. They vary. No two QRSs look the same. But if you like look at the overall strip as a whole, you can see that like the general trend is that like the size of the QRSs go up and then down and then up and down. So you can almost draw a sine wave if you like join all the tops of the QRSs and all the bottoms together. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, tell me at the end, I'll go over it. In VF, that wouldn't happen. It would just be like an absolute mess um, if you try to line like if you try to draw a line between the tops of all the QRSs it wouldn't work in the F um, and what what oh god sorry my laptops what causes um torsades a long QT yeah um, and this is one of those things that, that like past med will just drill into the back of your head. Um, and I'll say that like if you can learn it quite easily, it's helpful. If you can't, try and learn the big ones at least, um, just so you have a bit of awareness in your head. Um, so, yeah, if you have a prolonged QT, basically what happens is it will get longer and longer and eventually um, you'll start getting QRS complexes spontaneously happening in the QT interval and you'll eventually go into torsades. Um, so define what a prolonged QT is. Over 500, okay, anyone else? Over 440, okay. Any other suggestions on that? think it differs in males and females that's yeah okay I like that um so yeah generally remember like 440 but actually in males it's more than 430 and in women it's more than 450 um and how do you treat it in an like if if in an A to E I don't think they would do this to you but if they gave you a torsades what would be the like perfect yeah magnesium sulfate good okay um, and let's just like throw some causes of a prolonged QT into the chat. Macrolides, amiodrone, <laughs> yep, amiodrone is always the go-to one. Congenital, yep. Can um, any electrolyte abnormalities? Good, yep, hypocalcemia, anything else? Hypo, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, fine. Uh, let's move on to the next one. So you guys got this really well, which is this anemia. Um, and what are the other signs on someone's face that you'd see if they had anemia? During your like really great cardio exam. Yeah, you'd see some angular stomatitis or colitis, I think sometimes they call it. Um, and we're gonna do a quick, real quick whiz tour of anemia. Um, so my go-to when someone has, like my go-to if someone's got anemia is this table and working out where they sit on it basically. Um, so microcytic anemia, what causes a microcytic anemia? Yep. Thalassemia, good. Sickle cell, yep. And there's one other, the rare niche one. There you go, sideroblastic. Perfect. Okay. So 
Um, with iron deficiency anemia, tell me what happens to their ferritin. It's low, yep. Yeah. And as a consequence of that, what happens to their total iron binding capacity? Increases, yep. Yeah. And what happens to their transfer and saturations? It decreases, perfect. Um, and what that that like thought process and those markers, what does that help you distinguish iron deficiency anemia from? What's the other thing you're trying to distinguish it from? Yeah, anemia of chronic diseases, exactly. Um, so you guys all kind of had it in the chat, but I'm going to explain it anyway, just in case anyone wanted to hear the explanation. Um, so in iron deficiency anemia, the way I think about it is your iron's low. And in order to like make up for that, you use up your store, which is your ferritin. And then your body starts to think, right, I need to absorb more iron. And the way it transports the iron is by binding it to transferrin. So it like tries to increase its capacity to do that by basically increasing the amount of transferrin it's got. So you're like transferrin goes up, your capacity to bind iron to that transferrin goes up because your body's just trying to take as much as it can from your diet. But because that capacity has gone up, the actual amount that's bound to iron, the actual saturation goes down. Hopefully that makes sense. In anemia of chronic disease, that doesn't happen because the body doesn't recognize, like it recognizes that like your, your iron stores aren't the problem, it's something else. So, so that reaction doesn't happen. Um, and just take it with a pinch of salt because your ferritin could just be raised if you've got um, like an acute phase reaction. Okay, cool. Just quickly talk about thalassemia. When, when do you suspect thalassemia? specifically thalassemia trait. Um, so if they've got trait, will they be symptomatic? Yeah, exactly. So people who have trait won't necessarily be symptomatic and they might actually have a, a normal hemoglobin, but they will be, yeah, they'll have a disproportionately low MCV. Um, and what's the like definitive investigation to actually diagnose thalassemia? Genetic test, yeah, DNA analysis. And um, I kind of gave it away, uh, but the two main types are um, trait and major. And what's the key complication for, for like someone being treated for thalassemia major? Iron overload, perfect. So you give them chelating agents because um, they basically, yeah, you treat them with loads of transfusions and they get iron overload. Okay, causes of anormocytic anemia. Blood loss, yes. Acutely, yes. Chronic diseases, yep. Yeah. Time to start whacking up. Some hemolytic anemias, yes. CKD, yep. Yeah. Okay, let's see what I put down. So acute blood loss, yep. Um, Anemia of chronic diseases, C uh, CKD or renal failure, yep. I don't know about rheumatoid arthritis, actually. Um, Anoush, that one's for you. <laughs> um, That's uh, just chronic disease. What? It's just like chronic disease, anemia. Oh, yeah. oh I see. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Um, thank you. So myeloma, yes, because bone marrow failure. Um, pregnancy can do it. 
we'll come back to general malnutrition in a second. And hemolytic anemias and hypothyroidism can sometimes be a macro or a normocytic anemia. Okay, and then macrocytic anemia. Why would it be normo for felties? Yeah, I'm really glad you directed that to Noosh because I don't remember. Um, <laughs> alcoholism, hypothyroid, yep. B12 folate, yep. Any others? Potentially, yep. Cytotoxic drugs, yes. Um, okay, so B12 folate, yep. Um, alcohol excess and liver disease um, and antifolate drugs. So what's the main antibiotic um, for antifolate drugs that you've got to think about? Trimetoprim, yep. And what's the other antibiotic that is made up of trimetoprim? <laughs> Cotrimoxazole, yeah. And um, the reason why I mentioned that is because sometimes you can give cotrimoxazole for PCP prophylaxis, and that is when it will cause the anemia because they take it for so long rather than trimetoprim, which, yes, you give for a UTI, but five days won't touch their MCV. Um, okay, so going back to general malnutrition, why would that be a normocytic um, anemia now that we've met all together? Mixed, yeah, exactly. So you have some micro from the iron deficiency and some macro from the B12, and it will just manifest as a normocytic anemia. Um, and with the hemolytic and the hypothyroidism ones, um, what is the actual like cell that will decide whether it's macrocytic or no normocytic? Yeah, reticular sites. So basically, if they've actually got any reticular sites in their peripheral blood, that will push them to being a macrocytic anemia because reticular sites are so mature that they've got like quite a lot of cytoplasm. Um, so that's how I remember it. Okay, fine. So we've done the, the anemia, we've done the torsades. Let's tackle this abdomen in the middle. Um, Someone said that there's some injection marks, could be potentially an insulin pump. So we're thinking he has diabetes of some kind. Um, and there's like a dent as well. <laughs> Does anyone have any idea what this could be? Lipodystrophy, perfect. <laughs> and um, we're just gonna quickly talk about insulin therapy. Um, so what's the main type of insulin that you carry continue in DKA? basal yeah long acting their background insulin basically yep um and what type do you actually use to treat the dka and the rate please <laughs> a fixed rate yeah but what what is the rate this is one of the few i'd learn yeah perfect um and it's actor rapid yeah so it's fast acting insulin um if you go back a few sessions we did prescribe it so just make sure you can do that in case it's an a to e um or a prescribing station okay so the main complication of insulin is you give too much and they have a hypo so someone who's having a hypo how will they present Drowsy, yeah. <laughs> abdo pain. They might not have any abdo pain. I feel like that's only if they go into DKA. They'll be nauseous, yeah, lethargy, nauseous. 
um they'll sweat they might be a bit confused aggressive yeah okay and how do you treat nausea because not nausea sorry um hypoglycemia like if you were doing your a2e and they were completely fine and then they had hypoglycemia how would you treat it if they could yep yep the bnf says specifically three to four heaped teaspoons <laughs> in water but yeah you can just give 200 mils of orange juice as well according to the bnf um glucagon is the reversal agent yep yeah. and how do you give glucagon if they have iv access also yeah what would you give yeah you give im glucagon or iv um dextrose 10 percent um and B the bnf said like 15 to 20 grams over 15 minutes so it's all in the notes of the slide so don't worry um and what do you what with the hypos um what other medication do you want to avoid giving to those people like if you have a patient they've been admitted for high having a hypo and they're about to be discharged what on their medication review do you want to think about maybe like switching or stopping this is the extent of my pharmacology for you guys uh potentially a sulfonylurea i see what you mean yeah so the other oral hypoglycemics yep um but think anti-diabetic drugs as in not diabetic drugs i'd avoid these in asthma patients as well for a similar reason uh yes steroids maybe Beta blockers, exactly. Yeah. So beta blockers, like in asthmatics, they they like reduce their sensation of having like bronchoconstrictions. In diabetics, they reduce their hypo awareness. So someone could be having a hypo, and if they're on beta blockers, they might not know that they're having a hypo. Um, and if someone has recurrent hypos, what complication do you think is happening? This is the bit where I like chuck in something niche. So um, not insulinoma, um, I'm thinking about like gastric paresis, which is basically when um, when they get like neuropathy, they also get it in their like GI tract. So basically it takes their stomach longer to empty. So someone's just pumped themselves with insulin eaten, but the insulin acts earlier than the food actually hits them, if that makes sense. So they kind of like hypo because stuff just sits in their stomach for so long um okay and sick day rules basically if someone's ill tell them to keep taking their insulin um tell them to drink loads of water monitor their bms more and to drink loads of sugary stuff if they can't eat as much um and why do you keep telling them to take their hypoglycemics even if they're not eating as much What do you not want them to go into? Not quite. So basically, insulin is the thing that tells them, tells their body to not become ketotic. Um, so if they stop taking their insulin or hypoglycemics, they will go into DKA. And the reason why it's okay, even if they're not eating as much, to keep taking their hypoglycemics is because when you're ill, your cortisol goes through the roof as a stress response. So you're like you you will have glucose in your blood almost like enough to compensate for the amount you're not eating if that makes sense um but what you don't want them to do is stop taking their insulin basically okay finally what is the um the fundoscopy showing someone said some hemorrhages someone said some cotton wool spots um what kind of hemorrhages are we seeing this isn't CMV retinitis. And I'm going to say no to that just because I have no idea what that looks like. <laughs> um, 
this could be diabetic, but what else could it be? People who have diabetes tend to have other, yeah, hypertension, yeah. So this is hypertensive retinopathy. Um, and the stages for hypertensive retinopathy go from one to four. Um, and initially they just get some like silver wiring um, just put in the chat if you don't know what any of this looks like and I'll start pointing it out and Anush will start sending photos through um, and they get AV nipping um, and then at some point they'll start getting cotton wool spots um, and dot hemorrhages and then bigger blot hemorrhages and then eventually it'll start looking like a flame um, and the final stage is where you get papilledema and macular edema but basically I kind of want to explain this to you this might, we might overrun by five minutes, but I kind of want to explain this to you from the pathophysiology, just because that way you won't forget it. So when you have hypertension, normally your like retinal vessels are really good at regulating the blood pressure inside your eye. But if you have hypertension, the way it sort of responds and resorts to that is by just like, making your vessels slightly leaky so that you can keep the pressure low um, and that leaking is what causes you to sort of start getting the cotton wool exudates um, so just think really like think about it carefully in a question because if it says cotton wool spots and exudates that's path like pathologically due to stuff coming out of the capillaries if it said hard exudates that is actual lipids on the retina that's due to like hyperlipidemia diabetes not hypertension um and then basically the swelling of the optic disc and the papilledema um that's because eventually the vessels just like become fully leaky um and that doesn't that's not they have intracranial pressure that's just the edema making it look like it's swollen. It is swollen, but not due to raised intracranial pressure. Does that make sense? <laughs> if it doesn't, just ask me at the end, I'll go for it. Um, so cotton wools isn't due to, it is due to the high pressure, um, but it's like the physical yellow thing that you're seeing is like fluid coming out of the capillaries. It's just the capillaries become a bit more leaky to try and reduce the resistance and the pressure. It's not due to like actual lipid deposition in the retina. Because that's what hard exudates are. Yeah, okay, so finally, let's put this together. We've got someone who has anemia. We've got someone who has um, hypertension. We've got someone who's got diabetes and they've for some reason got prolonged QT, which may be causing well the prolonged QT is causing their torsades um is there anything that joins all of this together <laughs> they've got loads of cardiovascular risk factors and an electrolyte abnormality what condition could this be and it's really common renal failure yes <laughs> someone got it okay so this person has CKD and the prolonged QT the like thing I was going for was the hypocalcemia so um, last slide, um, a tiny bit on CKD and dialysis. So if you have someone who has AKI on CKD, it's your prescribing station. What are the drugs that you're going to cross out or not cross out, hold? Yep, ACE inhibitors, Ramapro, yep. And say, so if you're going to hold the ACE inhibitors, but they had a cough, so actually they're on a different drug. What what are you going to hold? Yep, that's it. They always go hand in hand. There's one other one that I'm thinking of, and say it's and. Diuretics, maybe. Um, double check with the new show. I'm not too sure. Diuretics tend to confuse me, so. I'm not sure, um, but I'm thinking of metformin. And why am I thinking of metformin? What's the complication you want to avoid? Yeah, 
yeah it can cause lactic acidosis exactly um okay and what are the the like big drugs that i i did remember that you have to dose adjust if someone has renal failure digoxin yeah antibiotics in general yes mm, which antibiotic specifically lithium yeah gentamicin perfect yeah um and insulin and opiates don't forget about those um what i would say is the tip that someone gave me was like have have like two or three in your head just in case someone asks you to recall and then you've got those but recognizing like which drug you might need to stop you have the bnf in that scenario so actually what you want to know is like make sure that you can look at someone's egfr and think oh this is low actually let me check the bnf and for me that threshold was around 45 30 like i told my like if that if someone had an egfr around that i'd always double check in the bnf whether a drug needs to be adjusted so learn like two or three just in case you need to recall them and then just tell yourself if someone has an egfr of like less than 30 less than 45 double check and um for dialysis who gets it what are the three main indications that you would refer someone to dialysis for Hyperkalemia not responding, yep. What's the other electrolyte? Acidosis that's not resolving, yep. Uncontrolled hypertension, acidosis, fluid overload, high urea, perfect. Yep, so um, fluid overload, they might have pulmonary edema, refractory potassium. Um, what's the acute treatment for hyperkalemia in an A2E? Oh, sorry, yeah, four. <laughs> um, calcium gluconate to stabilize the heart, perfect. And then Jessica's probably typing the thing that comes second. Insulin dextrose, perfect. Um, yeah, and on examination, for someone who has ure uremia, not due to like, as in it could be due to CKD, but due to anything, what is the like, pathonomic sign on examination for someone who has uremia asterisk yes and does anyone know why this is my other niche bit i was mind blown when i found this out by the way So um, basically, if you have really, really like the first thing that happens when you get encephalopathy due to the uremia is um, you start being a, you stop being able to like propriocept the like extensors and flexors in your arm. So when you ask someone to just hold that stop sign with their hands on examination, they're too encephalopathic, even though it's subtle to like be able to just keep the position between their flexors and extensors at that position. How fascinating. Okay, and finally, <laughs> what are the two main types of C uh, dialysis? Yeah, peritoneal and hemo, perfect. And I don't think I don't think it is the highest yield thing, but it could always be incorporated as part of a station to be like explained to this relative about like what the dialysis will entail. So I just remember like the key things which are like for the hemodialysis, they need a fistula and the fistula takes four to seven weeks to become functional. For the peritoneal one, they have a catheter and the main complication is that you might get an infection there. Um, and because it's a sort of line going into their body, what organism are we thinking? Staff, 
perfect yeah exactly and that's all I'd learn about <laughs> dialysis to be honest um cool so that's my last slide does anyone have any questions I'm gonna link you all the feedback now quickly 